Oh, wow, the stars of the late fall skies. Boy, are they gorgeous, all these bright stars. And with the binocular, you can see so much stuff. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being star curious today on Stay Curious. I'm stargazer Mark Marquette. And today we're going to talk about a constellation that everybody can see, probably has seen, or you'll be seeing it the next clear night in your own backyard, Orion the Hunter. One of the few constellations that actually looks like the thing it's supposed to represent. And we're going to see a lot of pictures of Orion, burn it into your head because it's rising in the east right now. It's just glorious. It's a beautiful sight to see, particularly those of you where there's uh, trees with the leaves are off of them. And you can literally see Orion rising in between the limbs and branches, the stars twinkling. And though it's cold, where most of you are at watching Stay Curious, it's worth bundling up and getting outside, finding a lawn chair, have a, have a pair of binoculars, a star chart with you, and a red flashlight. So you see that star chart uh, in the... Uh, Yep, that is red. There we go. Every red flashlight has to be knocked around a little bit for it works right. But the red, you can read star charts and your eyes do not, again, uh, contract after they've been dilated. Because that is an important thing to see the most you can in your backyard. Let your eyes get accustomed to sitting there in your lawn chair. Block the neighbor's light if you can with the tree or the edge of the house. You might not be able to see all of the sky at one time, but but whatever you want to look at that night and learn, and you can learn a lot with a star chart, a red flashlight, and binoculars. And that's where I started in astronomy as a young boy many, many moons ago. But I uh, wanted to say hello to my co-producer, Marty. How are you, buddy? Good, good Mark. How about you? Good, Marty. We're kicking off episode 726 on Stay Curious here, and we've been doing Stargazer and uh, Stay Star Curious for uh, a couple years of that stretch there as much as we can, because that's my, my wheelhouse. What I brought originally to the museum was uh, telling our executive director, Karen Conklin, that astronomy was the bright, shiny object that brought people into places. Because you throw a telescope out on a sidewalk, and everybody wants to look through it, most everybody anyway. Uh, I've never seen an amateur biologist dissecting a frog on the street, okay, for fun. But boy, we amateur astronomers have a lot of fun taking our telescopes to parties, star parties, city events, scouts, wh wherever. Uh, to show people the wonders of the night. So you're going to enjoy learning about Orion the Hunter today here on Star Curious. I'm going to put my eyes on so I can read. Orion, of course, uh, looks like a, a man in the sky. He was the handsome and strong mythological uh, hero in many stories. Uh, he chased beautiful women uh, ran off his adversaries, including Scorpius, that is on the opposite side of the sun. Uh, it, it is a prominent constellation in the south during the summertime. And Orion, as it rises up on his side, like he's waking up and getting up out of bed, you'll see it distinctly here, that he's rising on his side. But uh, by by about midnight, he is directly south, gigantic looking creature, just like in this picture. Orion has uh, two belts that makes his shoulders, two that make his knees, three belts that make up his uh, stars that make up his belt. So that's the first thing you always look for is this row of three stars. And then you know that is the waist of Orion. And he's got a club in his hand, uh, raising it above himself, his right hand as you're looking at him, his left hand, he's got um, a shield or an animal skin uh, is what is depicted in mytho mythology. All right, there is a shot of Orion. Hmm, that is a backward shot of Orion. We're going this way to show you Orion. Some of these pictures I've, I've taken, quite a few of them you're going to see, including this one. Orion rising over Kennedy Space Center. All right, and Orion is right there, of course. Uh, you see the three rows of stars right uh, above the uh, launch complexes there. 
this is a uh, uh, taken during the night, but the the light pollution from Kennedy Space Center's illuminated clouds making a beautiful scene up there, which is I want to encourage all of you that enjoy photography. All you need to make great photos of Orion yourself with that digital camera or digital phone these days is a steady hand. Therefore, put your camera on a tripod or if you have a smartphone, uh, put it in your uh, selfie stick and mount the selfie stick somewhere and take an exposure of, of uh, five seconds, 10 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. Uh, you will not get stars trailing until about a minute long in an exposure. So you can take some quick exposures with your ISO or camera sensitivity jacked way up to like 2000 if you have that or even higher. So you're going to see some examples of these photos here. Like this beautiful one that is, again, the Orion belt. You see it. And the two stars that make his shoulders, one is denoted there, Betelgeuse. I did not take this picture, but we're going to talk about Betelgeuse. Uh, kind of sounds like the movie Betelgeuse. Uh, this star actually dimmed, and there it is showing in kind of its dimmer state uh, a couple years ago when it should be as bright as the knee star, the white star above the tree line there, Rigel, but it definitely dimmed even to my trained eye in uh, 2019 to 2020 uh, very dramatically. And we're going to talk about why we think it dimmed and, and what kind of star it is that could change its brightness. Well, Orion is rising in the east. And then, of course, as it gets up higher, it assumes more of a vertical stance. In this same area of the sky are... Uh, Four very prominent constellations and a, and a handful, about seven really bright stars. Of the top 20 brightest stars, you can see six or seven of them in just one view of the sky. And that is the time to look right now. We've got Taurus the Bull is above uh, Orion with the Pleiades star cluster is in the shoulder of the bull there. The uh, Taurus snorts nearby, and the twin brothers of, of uh, uh, Gemini are also above his shoulder. Now, I've told you before on Stay Star Curious that my favorite planetarium in a box in a computer show uh, is the Stellarium. Think aquarium, like water, skies, or stellar Stellarium. There's an app for that in your smartphone. Uh, or if you have another app, go ahead and use it. But this is tonight's sky where you've got Orion in the middle there. Up above is Taurus the Bull, shaped like a V. And Mars is, is very uh, between Aldebaran, which is a red star, and the Pleiades. So Mars is a lot redder than the other reddish star, Aldebaran. And Betelgeuse is also red. Mars is red because of the rust on the deserts uh, make it red. Aldebaran and Betelgeuse are red because they are gigantic stars that have cooled down. And when things are cooler, they look, they shift to the red. When things are hotter, they shift to the white or blue. So that gives you an indication of how hot these stars are in relationship to other stars, the color contrast. And we put the creatures of mythology on our, sky, on our sky for tonight. And imagine Orion there with his club in his hand. And he's got a lion skin in the other hand. Below him is Cirrus, the brightest star in the sky is rising. Now Jupiter and Mars look brighter than Cirrus, but still Cirrus is the brightest star in the sky. It is in the big dog, and between Orion and the big dog is Lepus the hare. We've got Procyon is the other star on the bottom there that is in the little dog. Between the two dogs is a unicorn called Monoceros. And there we've got Gemini the brothers, Capella, is a character of mythology and uh capella is a star in origa the charioteer up there in the upper left and uh erodinus the river flows through above my head there you go out and look at this star uh drama going on every night and take your 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 constellation 
planisphere with you and set the date. And of course, if you're, as you could go in, out for a half an hour, go back in, get warmed up, go back out two hours later, everything's going to be risen higher in the sky. And then you can see new things. But it's fun to learn the constellations from your backyard and then look up the mythology uh, as you're going to sleep that night or the next day. And and just there's these are so dramatic, these, these stories being told in the night sky. And there's Orion up close again. Every one of its beautiful stars uh, has a name to them. We're going to go over some of those names here. They're very interesting some of the names there. Betelgeuse. No better way to spring what Betelgeuse in Arabic means to you than looking at this superimposed picture of Orion. Betelgeuse actually means armpit of the giant. And you can see why. Well, there we're back to looking at in the sky. It gets lost in all the other stars out there. But as it gets darker, and you're in a dark place. It really sticks out. So this is how Orion's looking at about 7 o'clock. We know it's getting dark at 6 o'clock. Days are getting a little longer. And there's some of the names. Orion's Belt is very well known. The two stars of the... Um, the shoulders are called, we already said, Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is 310 light years away and is zero magnitude. Now, this magnitude is an arbitrary scale where zero magnitude is 2.5 times brighter than first magnitude. First magnitude is 2.5 times brighter than second magnitude. And the faintest we can see on a reasonably dark skies like a mountaintop is sixth magnitude. And you go out in the Arizona deserts, you might be able to see down to seventh magnitude, but not much more. But from your backyard, and you're going to be lucky to see fourth magnitude. So you're going to see first, second, third magnitude stars, and stars that are brighter than for zero or first magnitude, they, they go into negative magnitudes, okay? Uh, which only a couple stars are that. One being Cirrus is like a minus one. So I'll tell you that all these stars of Orion are pretty bright. All of them are third magnitude or more. And um, Bellatrex, the other bright star that's the shoulder, is also a little over 300 light years away, which means the light we're looking at of Betelgeuse and, and Bellatrex left those stars 300 and some years ago. Well, we're in 2023, so that'd be 1723 in the 1700s. So when we're looking at Betelgeuse, we're looking uh, at light that left Betelgeuse uh, before America become uh, America since 1776. So this is the 1720s going on. And this is a fun way to look at the time machine that is the stars of our night sky. Again, to show you the other constellations around it. All right, uh, uh, Aldebaran looks like a V. Aldebaran's a star. Taurus is a V shape. Gemini, the two bright stars, Castor and Pollux. And then there's a, a row of stars like twins that come off of it. Well, you can't see Orion too good in here, but it is right off my shoulder over here. Okay, there's the belt stars. All right, clouds again. Even though it's cloudy out, go outside and, and, and see if you can outdo the clouds. But there's Orion rising, Taurus the bull, the Pleiades. All right, between the Pleiades and Taurus are going to be Mars tonight. But this is the scene setting. And then as time goes, Mars, the, or Orion stands up uh, like on his own two feet looking like this. All right. Well, let's look at the belt stars there real quick. Uh, uh, the belt stars have got the name Alnitak, which means the girdle. Alnilam means string of pearls. And Mintaka means the belt. Well, Alnitak and Alnilab are each a little over a thousand light years away. That's why they're, they could be a more powerhouse of energy, but they're over a thousand light years away, where Betelgeuse up there in the armpit is uh, only 300 light years away. So it being close also makes it brighter. Where Mintaka is twice as far away 
The, the, the belt star on, on the upper right is twice as far away as the other two. And yep, you can see that it's a little bit fainter in these pictures. There we have the names of them all there. Saf and Rigel, the two knees of the uh, Orion. Uh, Rigel is 910 light years away, yet it is zero magnitude. It's about the same magnitude as Betelgeuse. It's three times further away. So what does that tell you? Rigel is pumping out more energy than Betelgeuse, so it's farther away. However, both are what we call supergiant stars. That means these are stars that have, have, have gotten enlarged through the, the, uh, the history that we know of a life cycle of a star is well known and it starts out how big the star is when it's born determines where it's going to be on what is called the Hertzsprung Russell diagram and we'll talk about that one day but all stars have a predictable uh, uh, path those that are kind of average stars like our sun will live to be 8 to 12 billion years old these big stars like Rigel and Betelgeuse they're going to be lucky to live four or five billion years they are huge. In fact, Betelgeuse, if we put it in our solar system, it where our sun is, would su is so big it would suck up Mars's orbit. All right, it's that big over a uh, hundred million miles across. Same way with Rigel, is it is uh, very huge, uh, not as quite as big as Betelgeuse. And then Saf, the, the other knee star there, is 1,300 light years away in a second magnitude. So it's almost twice as far away as Rigel. So this kind of lets you understand that just because stars are lined up and form this Orion the Hunter constellation, the stars really don't have much to do with each other. However, we think some of these stars were like born out of the same cosmic cloud. Uh, and like the Big Dipper, those seven stars. Well, let's look at some of the pretty pictures of Orion at night. And in fact, what we're looking at behind me is the drop-down belt of Orion. Here is the belt of Orion right there in the middle. Okay. You see the belt of Orion coming down uh, the belt. Then you got the sword is dropping down from the belt. That's the sword. Right in the middle of the sword, that's not a star. That's what's behind me, the Orion Nebula, one of the most famous objects in the sky, easily seen with binoculars. It looks like a faint little fuzzy, cottony gray ball, like all these deep sky objects do, because we cannot see color with our eye through the telescope and binoculars. Very few things look colorful to us because our eye's not that sensitive to it. We're going to see plenty of pictures of Orion's nebula here. But that is in the belt, that, uh, the sword that hangs down from the belt stars there. <coughs> Excuse me there a minute. Uh, so, this is about the way it looks in your backyard. Okay, you can expect it to look that uh, many stars uh, prominently in your backyard. You go to a darker site or a longer time exposure and you see other stars between these bright stars. And I did a little technique there, you photographers, where I used a soft filter. May I, I may have taken a 10 second exposure at say 2000 ISO, but for five seconds I held a, a soft filter over it to make the stars get a little bit more blobby there. And you see that Betelgeuse is a very red, red star, and Rigel is a very white star, meaning that Rigel's super hot, a lot hotter than, than um, um, Betelgeuse. And yet Rigel is, what did I say, 900 light years away, and Betelgeuse is about 300 light years away. So the light we're seeing from Rigel here, where I'm pointing, left 900 years ago from... Uh, uh, the year 2000, so that was around, you know, the uh, 1100 AD is when the light left that star and is hitting us now. Well, another technique I did, I'd like to do, is put a star filter 
on your photo. So not only did I enlarge with a the stars just a little bit with a um, soft focus filter, like a number three, and then I put a star filter on there to highlight it, would make it a pretty picture of the constellations there. The brightest stars will give you the star hex of there. And so a technique that might take you a few tries to master, but that's something fun to do with your camera in your backyard with the most notable of all men in the sky, Orion the Hunter. Well, again, we're looking at... Uh, a little bit of uh, the distances there. And what you note is Betelgeuse and Bellatrex, the shoulder stars, are about the same distance away. And Saf and Rigel, the knees, they're 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 twice they're three times further away or, or or further, all right, to get that perspective. And then you've got the belt stars are also kind of like Saf and Rigel, three times further away than the shoulder stars there. To again emphasize the stars have very little to do with each other. Yet the Great Nebula of Orion is about the same distance as the Belt stars, so we know that it may have been born out of the same solar nebula at one time. And it's 1,300 light years away and 15 light years wide. Okay, so when you're seeing that with your eye in your own backyard, that thing is 15 light years wide. It is in, in 1,300 light years away. All right. You would think that'd be the farthest object you could see with your naked eye, but it's not because the Andromeda galaxy, uh, and we'll be featuring that maybe next week, you can see it with your naked eye, and it's over 2 million light years away outside of our own Milky Way galaxy, of course, the Andromeda galaxy. Again, this is the same picture looking back there just to think about those stellar distances. Well, what is truly amazing, Marty, when uh, about stargazing and astronomy is our eye is so limited at what we can see. And, and the constellation Orion is embedded in a gaseous cloud that is a tremendous stellar nursery. We talk about our museum being in the delivery room of America's Space Age, Brevard County. Well, Ryan is part of a huge delivery room of cosmic stars in the Milky Way, a gaseous cloud called in part Bernard's Loop. This is unseen to human eyes, but detected in time exposures with a special filter called a hydrogen filter. So if we could have see all the hydrogen that is around the stars of Orion, what would that look like? I'm glad you asked. Look at this incredible, incredible image. Let me go back. <clears throat> There's Orion. You see the three belt stars. The three stars of its belt are nearly lost in what is called Bernard's Loop, after the astronomer that discovered this by taking just a regular camera and putting a hydrogen filter on it. Now, this is a very specialized technique. But because hydrogen is the the most common commodity in the the the, the universe, uh, it's everywhere. And when it clumps together, and and the gravity and so forth starts creating mass, and stars can be born in a cosmic cloud. This is unfathomably big. This is a photograph taken by my friend Matt Harbison of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, this is not one image. This is thousands of images stitched together and Matt's spending thousands of hours of time. What he would do, he would just isolate one little area uh, and, and take uh, just small little snippets of it and then put it together in one gigantic image. Again, this is what we don't see with our eye. There's Orion and this is what I wish we could see, the gigantic cosmic cloud that it is immersed in unfathomably large and unseen to our eye. Let's drop down and look at the three belt stars in the Orion Nebula there. This is only like about a 200 millimeter lens, all right? And uh, I did have a motor driven uh, 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 mount to, to uh, take maybe a one minute exposure here with the star filter. And there in the middle, you see the great nebula of Orion. It is given the designation M42, M for the great French astronomer Charles Messier, 
who cataloged over 100 objects that were faint and fuzzy and didn't move in the sky because he wanted to discover comets. And that's how you become famous in the 1800s was because it was discover a comet and that could be named for you, like Halley's Comet that Edmund Halley didn't see, but he predicted. So, uh, of course, Messier did discover some comets, but he kept going back to these objects and they didn't move, so he knew they weren't comets. He didn't know what they were, and he class this was the 42nd one that he classified in his great Messier catalog, which you can see these Messier objects like M42, the Great Nebula of Orion, with binoculars. Everybody has binoculars, Marty. Most people have them for sports. A lot of some people are birding. Actually, birding is a hobby that has four times more people involved in it than than, than stargazing, believe it or not. So uh, get those binoculars and make sure they work right and uh, uh, do some binocular gazing in your own backyard. Well, this is a very modest photograph I took of the Orion Nebula through a telescope. It's one of the first objects that any stargazer want, uh, wants to try to get his chops on astrophotography. and uh, But it has like a fan shape to it. Uh, and then embedded in it, uh, overexposed there, are four stars that were just born out of this gigantic cosmic cloud 15 light years across. Again, what is 15 light years, Marty? The closest star to Earth, Alpha Centauri, is over four light years away. So this is four times the distance of the closest star, the width of this thing. Close up, like Matt took a photo of through a telescope, you actually see a lagoon over here on uh, between it and a cl and another part of it bursting out on the other side over there all right yes this is clouds obscuring the birth of stars beneath there and there's four new stars inside there that you can see with your own eyes they're called a trapezium uh it's they're overexposed here to get the beautiful tentacles so to speak of the, the this Orion Nebula. Again, 15 light years across, going at 8 trillion miles an hour, it would take you 15 years to go from one side to the other. All right, there it is there. There's Matt's picture of it. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mark Poole. Uh, happy little fireball, Orion. All right. Uh, He, I think he's got a little meteor in there somewhere, but this is his photo of it. Again, you can see on the left side, you know, it's, it's like the, the energy's poking out through there, but it's obscured by this dark cloud that's light years in front of us. And here is the uh, uh, a close-up of the Horsehead Nebula on the left side there. The Horsehead Nebula is next to one of the, the first star Alnitak. attack. Uh, in the belt, and uh, I didn't dwell on the Horsehead Nebula because it's something you'll never see with your naked eye only in photography. But when we take photos of things in the night sky, there's a new uh, normal, Marty. Uh, what do you think we see these streaks are that messed up this photo of the Orion Nebula? Any guess, Marty? Nope, sorry. <laughs> Marty, those are Starlink satellites that were launched a few days uh, before this amateur astronomer was spent the time to align his telescope and was going to make a wonderful picture for his personal library of the Orion telescope. And in a matter of his 10-second exposure there, these Starlink satellites went through. This is the aggravation that is being created in the ast astronomy community. Now, there is an algorithm that this uh, image could be put in and it would take out those streaks, okay, and replace them with just black areas there. But you lose the data there, okay. And amateur astronomers, who cares about us in our backyards? It's the true astronomers that are on top of the great mountaintops in uh, uh, South America and Hawaii and other parts of the world. They, too, are having Starlink satellites pass in front of their 
astrophotography and uh, there's some compromises that are going to have to be made. The uh, SpaceX has made a, a heavier, uh, darker coating on their buses, the main structure that they call these things, uh, so they don't reflect as much uh, sunlight. But that's what's happening is sunlight is reflecting off the sides in, in the uh, solar panel, these Starlink satellites that I think we're up to about 3,000 Marty orbiting Earth. Yeah. I don't know, but it sounds about right. Yeah, three to 4,000, and there is a permission to orbit 30,000 of these. So just thought I'd like you to know when amateur astronomers grumble, or when I grumble about another Starlink satellite batch of 50 or so going up, it's not all making me happy. <laughs> so, well, let's talk here as we're... On the home stretch here of staying star curious, hope you've enjoyed learning about the, the stars of uh, Orion and look into the mythology yourself and look at them yourself in your backyard with new appreciation. Well, thank you, Marty, for giving me the Tom UCX watching today and Steve Hammer, Ophelia Sauterl's watching in, in France, uh, Mary Lou Kozowski, thank you for watching. Uh, Marius Lozowski, Lisa Marie, Carlton Bailey, Doug Forrest, Dave Stangy, William Whiting, and Cynthia Rossi's watching. And I got to see Cynthia today out at the Space Center. Uh, good to see you, young lady, out there. We were at the uh, Memorial for Walt Cunningham today, a brief ceremony in their fabulous Hall of Fame out there at the Delaware North Run Kennedy Space Center Visitors Complex. Well, the atmosphere of Betelgeuse. This is a star that the Hubble telescope can actually see the, the surface of. And the Webb is working on that. Uh, they're, 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 this is very much in the play that the Webb telescope might be able to see a defined uh, edge on Betelgeuse and st uh, star spots on it. We can't call them sunspots because our star is named sun. We call them star spots. Maybe those are common like on our sun. But we think Betelgeuse being so huge, like I said, it's over 100 miles in diameter, which if we put it where our sun is, that would it would suck up Mars' as orbit. So it's like a, one of those gigantic uh, 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 bubble balloon things that you make with your kids or grandkids, Marty, where it's big and wobbly and so forth. That's what we think these super giant stars are at the end of their life. But we know one thing about Betelgeuse, it's going to blow up one day. This is the life cycle of these kind of stars that astronomers have, have studied for over 100 years. And we know that it is in, its, in the throes of almost ready to blow up as a supernova that one day you'll go out in the night sky. You might see it at daytime first. And then you go out and look, and there it is, casting a shadow. It'll be so bright at the night. It may even be so bright in the daytime it'll cast a shadow. We know that's going to happen within the next million years. Just hope it happens next week so I can see it. But uh, seriously, it's, it's so when Betelgeuse started to faint and, and get fainter, and... Um, I wanted to see if I could find any notes I made on that over the history of our doing these programs. It was in uh, 2019, right at the beginning of the global pandemic, that uh, Orion started to fade. And it was very noticeable um, that uh, it was dimming. One day you'd look up and you're going, that doesn't look quite right. Uh but uh, it actually lost over one magnitude. It went from zero to uh, uh, first magnitude. Uh, and everyone was kind of hoping, oh, my God, is this the, the, the week it's going to blow up? Is this one of the signals of it? Once again, it's over 300 light years away. So we, it may have already blown up, and, and, but we won't know it uh, until whatever time frame that it blew up in that 300-year distance, reaches us. What we, what we saw, though, from the Hubble telescope was a dimming of like something was moving in front of it. All right? As you can see, this dark area here and darker area there. You put something in front of a bright object, it makes it dimmer. This is how we've discovered other planets orbiting other stars. 
is the line of sight is just right that the planet goes in front of the star and dims that star. I mean, by by incredible minute amounts that astronomers are measuring with scientific instruments. So, uh, but this is actual Hubble telescope images of Betelgeuse. And you see it's not completely round. It's got some wobbly, strange shape to it there. Uh, so we have figured out that what most likely happened in this photograph of scenarios now, this is artist conceptions, that Betelgeuse actually erupted with a gigantic solar flare that if something like this happened on our Earth, it could kill life on Earth. If it happened on our sun, I mean, could our star. And actually, we couldn't see this explosion from Earth, though they went back and noticed that it, that it had gotten a, a little bit brighter. But whatever it threw out created a cosmic cloud once it cooled down immediately in the environs of space from the million degree temperatures that it left of, of the star. And then it kind of hung around in front of it for a little while, like a, like a little little handkerchief in front of it, hiding or saying peekaboo behind this cloud. But it was big enough and dense enough that it knocked the, di the brightness of, of a Betelgeuse down. And it has restored, okay? Now, summertime, Orion is in the daytime sky, all right? That's why, we, that's why they couldn't monitor this 24-7, 12 months a year though radio telescopes could look at it during the daytime. So quite interesting that we watch this happen in our lifetime, my lifetime, the only star that we have observed to do this that we didn't know was going to do this. There are thousands of stars in the night sky that change their brightness. Those are called variable stars. A couple of them go from about second magnitude to fourth magnitude, okay? One in Perseus named Algol is a famous one of that, and Perseus is in the sky right now, and we'll visit that on a Stay Star Curious program. But a lot of stars vary in brightness by just a little bit, and one of them we look at every day, our star, the sun, is slightly variable star, and that people do not factor that in to global climate change, that a, a warming st a sun affects the Earth's warmth, too. It's very minute, not like some of these stars that can change a whole magnitude of brightness, which on an algorithmic scale is 2.5 times brighter than the first magnitude, is 2.5 times brighter than second magnitude. So a lot of people study variable stars. There's also double stars out there that people study. That's not my cup of tea. I like where the action is with the uh, planets and the moon and uh, the uh, galaxies and nebula that I love hunting in the sky at night, just like I hope you get inspired to as a treasure hunt. And there's a lot on the sea in Orion. There's over 20 celestial objects there besides the great nebula and the um, um, horsehead nebula. There's a couple star clusters. There's other nebulas in there. And once again, his dogs are by himself. Orion the Hunter's two dogs, Canis Major and Canis Minor, both with bright stars in them. And Orion is a site for, uh, you can find Sirius, of course, is rising just above the horizon here about 7 o'clock. And it is the brightest star we will see in the sky, northern or southern, southern hemisphere. And my good friend Cliff Watson, when he's watching Orion rising, in Pomona, Australia, it's upside down, uh, just like the moon is upside down to you Aussies down there that are now enjoying the throes of summertime, my buddy Cliff. Uh, in October, we have the Gem uh, Orionid meteor shower that emanates out of the Orion Nebula there. You can see right above my head, is the uh, there's the Great Nebula right there and the three stars of the belt. And my buddy Matt Harbison uh, from the uh, dark uh, site of uh, a Tennessee Park. And there's Orion again. All right. And what's happening here, do you think? Well, this is the International Space Station going through Orion. And somebody, every five seconds or every one se probably about every five seconds, uh, put a hat or something in front to chop up the line and make it a choppy line. They just simply... Uh, uh, covered up the exposure for about uh, uh, 
a, a split second to get that line in there. And you can see it's not the same length. And there's Orion again with a palm tree. And what's coming out of his knees there? I put some stilts on him, Marty, so he could walk around a little bit. Actually, those stilts are two airplanes that I saw go by. Uh, no, actually, the bottom one is the International Space Station, again, going through. And the, the one on the left that's blinking is an airplane. So I got the International Space Station and an airplane blinking at the same time on one frame of an Im on a, a digital image. Just a couple of things you can do with your telescope, uh, without a telescope, I mean, to have fun stargazing. And uh, thank you, Neil1030 and Tom Celentano, for watching today. Uh, I'll bet uh, Anthony Achilles is watching. Uh, appreciate that, my friend out there, Carlton Bailey. Hello to you and all of our friends out there on, here on the Space Coast that we're now seeing on a regular basis out there. So I hope... Oh, one other Orion in the sky. Well, it's not really in the sky, but the Orion spacecraft, all right? Inspired to be named after the great hunter in the sky. This awesome photograph taken from one of the 50 cameras. There's a bunch of cameras on this thing. I think 12 cameras on one of the uh, uh, solar panels there. Took this as it was going by the moon. That's the coolest shot I saw of the Artemis 1 Orion spacecraft. It's now, Marty, just about nine miles from you and I are sitting in the Boeing uh, uh, former Orville Processing Facility, but the Boeing building by the VAB. So I hope that you've all enjoyed looking and uh, uh, an Orion from your own backyard. Get your binoculars out and enjoy a little stargazing this week because the moon is now uh, not rising until about 10 11 o'clock each night the moon rises about 50 minutes later so it's out of our regular evening sky so you can go out after supper do a little stargazing get your planisphere with you read up a little bit about these stars of uh, of orion get your red flashlight so you can Identify some of these stars out there on your map, all right? And have some fun like I do, just relaxing and doing a little stargazing in my own backyard. Thank you for enjoying this episode of Staying Star Curious. I'll be back again with you next week as I'm Mark Marquette saying, I can't wait to see you under the stars to bridge the space between us. <laughs>